Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Says the Vet. So this is a follow-on video from an episode on how to recognize facial eczema. We tend to think of it as sunburn, which is the common sign, but there are other ways that it can present, especially in goats, alpaca, and llama. They tend to have their own thing going on. So check out that episode here. And for now, let's crack on to how to prevent it. I'll see you in a sec. Hi guys, cheers for checking in, I'm Dr. Sears. So let's jump straight into how to prevent facial eczema on your farm or lifestyle block. It is so prevalent, especially in the Upper North Island of New Zealand. Even if you don't think you've got it, you almost certainly do. Warm, humid, fungus growing weather. Toxins from that fungus damage the liver and remember those animals we see outwardly affected and obvious to us represent only 10 to 20% of those suffering on the inside. It affects their productivity for production animals and cuts short a long happy life for your pets. So prevent, prevent, prevent. Here we go. Firstly, monitoring spores. Now, we're going to start in chronological order as if you're going through the year, in order of what you're going to do, okay? So as summer rolls around, usually around early Jan, what you want to do is start watching the spore counts for your area. So often vet clinics in your area will post these spore counts somewhere online on their websites, or they may even send out weekly email updates for your area. Now every piece of land is unique. Your block is going to be unique compared to your neighbours, so this is only an indication of what's going on. For sheep and cattle, we're watching those spore counts rise, and when they rise to 20,000, you're going to start your preventative zinc dosing, which is protective for the animal when we give them zinc into the mouth. Now we're aiming for that to start about two weeks before the danger zone, so it's a little bit of a guess, but about 20,000 seems to be about right. Over 40,000 is considered the danger zone. 80 to 100,000 is when we see very sudden, severe disease on the outside. But realistically, research indicates that we will get liver damage when an animal has been grazing for less than a week on 100,000, about two weeks at 50,000, and about 20 days at 30,000. So you can see that even with those, what we normally consider as relatively low-ish spore counts, over time, over the summer, they will add up and you definitely still get disease. Alpaca and llama are highly susceptible and their danger zone is much lower at just 10,000. Add to that the fact that they try to hide disease from you so well and it means you really do need to start preventative zinc for them even earlier. So at these levels, you're either gonna jump in and start your preventions with zinc or if you wanna hold off, then you need to be monitoring your own paddocks, okay? So go ahead and do that if you choose to go that route. You can spore count for your own paddocks through your vet clinic. And if you do, this is gonna to contribute to your area's spore count, so you're helping out your neighbors as well. I definitely recommend doing this at least once while you live on your block because it does give you knowledge of which paddocks are worst hit and which tend to be safe anyway. The safest ones tend to be shady, south-facing, those that are copping a lot of wind. The wind dries out the pasture. Hot and humid is where those spores want to prevail. So to hand in samples to spore count your own paddocks, you do want to do each paddock. You're going to take multiple samples walking diagonally across the paddock and then you're going to mix those together. Avoid picking grass from shady areas and you want to pick grass to the length that the animal would be eating. So for example, if you're grazing cattle up to about two to three centimetres off the ground, sheep tend to bite down a little bit lower again. Mix it all together and you want to hand in around about a bread bag size. Um, they, they're not going to need very much, but it's good to kind of mix it all together in that bread bag and hand in one labelled for each paddock and hand that into your vet clinic so that when you get the results back, you can know, awesome, that's our safest paddock. So if disease hits, that's where we're moving them, for example. And of course, it's going to give you an exact time of when you need to start your preventative zinc. So you've hit a spore count of 20,000 for the area or for your specific farm. How are you going to get zinc into them? species are different. Now the easiest and most reliable way for cattle and sheep is to give a time capsule down the throat. It looks like a big silver bullet. Vets and veterinary technicians can do this for you if you're not comfortable as there is a risk of accidentally popping it down the windpipe and suffocating the animal or traumatizing the back of the throat and having infection set in. I have put a wee tutorial on how to bolus for facial eczema, so if you're doing it yourself, catch that here. Now zinc time capsules slow release in the stomach over about six weeks, so they're protected for about six weeks. At that point, you can give another dose for another six weeks or a smaller dose to last for the four weeks. 
longer than about 100 days we start to run into zinc toxicity. So you don't want to do it too long or start giving zinc too early in the season before they need it, otherwise they're left vulnerable at the other end of the season, if that makes sense. Now these zinc capsules do not work for alpaca and llama. Their stomachs are slightly different and they break down the outer coating far too quickly. So instead of a nice long duration of release, they get a big spike and then it doesn't protect them for long. They're not appropriate. So for alpaca and llama, or if you'd rather not use capsules down the throat in your sheep, then there are other options. You can give zinc pellets daily, or you can add a zinc oxide directly to the food. Make sure you add some molasses in there to hide the bitter taste. Now for cattle, you can add it to the water supply. I don't tend to recommend this. It makes the water taste funny and it's just such unreliable dosing per individual animal. Sheep and alpaca have such a variable water intake anyway and are more likely just to reject the water altogether. So choose another option if you can. We tend to use the adding it to water in sort of beef cattle farms where they're, they're turned out and not handled very much. Now with zinc pellets or adding zinc oxide powder to their food, Beware to make sure that everyone gets their dose, especially with alpaca and llama who work on a strict hierarchy in their group. They need individual feed buckets and they need to be well spaced apart so we don't get certain individuals stealing others' food. And of course you do get some individuals who just refuse to eat pellets, which is why for sheep, at least, the time capsules are always the most reliable route. Now if you're adding zinc oxide as a powder to food, you want to do this every four to five days so long as you've started before the danger period rolls around. If you've started giving it well into the season or you've already noticed facial eczema signs in your animals, you'll need to be giving it daily and we call this crisis dosing. In alpaca and llama, I would recommend giving it daily anyway. Now because breeding for tolerant genetics is possible and we can see amazing results in just five years, this should always be your key long-term plan, especially if you're in the business of breeding or on a farm. So, there is two ways you can do this. There is an official certification scheme you can go through, which is very accurate and it's very valuable if you want to sell or hire out those rams. It takes about a month and you want to do it with each generation. They also organise everything for you through your local vet, so it's pretty user-friendly. Now basically what will happen, your vet will come out, dose your rams with the same dose of facial eczema toxin each, and then come back and blood test them all. Those that show high signs of limb damage are culled, and those ones that are least affected are bred from. And you do this every year for each generation. And as I say, across five to 10 years, you get massive results. So a really good way to go. For lifestylers, or if you don't want to do the official certification route, then what you want to do is ask your vet to come and blood test your rams and your ewes at the end of the facial eczema season, so at the end of the dry hot summer for GGT. Now your vet will know what to test for, but for your own info, GGT is an enzyme that's released into the blood when the liver is malfunctioning, so it's an indication of liver damage. You don't need to cull any pets, no one has to die. It's just a good piece of data to have because then you know who, who should you be breeding from, who should probably not have babies again. And finally, managing your pasture. Now these fungal spores are sitting down in the damp, what we call pasture litter. And this is dead grass where it forms a bit of a mat at the base up to about four or five centimeters high. So first things first is don't graze them down hard. Keep them rotating through those paddocks a little bit faster than you normally would so that the grass stays that much longer. We don't want them grazing the, the low grass where that leaf litter is. This may mean that you need to have less animals on the land. If you're a farmer, consider selling some stock off earlier for the season. For pets, consider would the neighbours let you use a paddock during summer maybe or could you buy in hay to try and give that pasture a rest. If you're motivated, planting out a different type of pasture altogether actually makes a big difference. So chicory, plantain, tall fescue and red and white clover all tend to be relatively safe compared to ryegrass. If you're not able to completely re-sow the pasture, that's probably quite unrealistic on a lot of lifestyle blocks, even just over sowing with clover seeds in spring will help to reduce the load for that season. So that just means sprinkling red and white clover seeds over what's already growing. Now the clover won't grow back well when the ground becomes dry, so it is only a short-term help once they've eaten that clover down, it's not gonna grow back very well and the grass will dominate the pasture again. So if you do wanna do this, it's good to do just with a paddock or two and then you can kind of set that aside and know that that's, those are your safer paddocks for the high risk period. Don't let grass length get out of hand coming into summer. If it gets too long, you start getting dead pasture litter and more fungus. Avoid topping it, chopping off the top 
Um, this just leaves dead chopped pasta behind and this will be setting up the pasta for prime fungal growth as well, okay? Couple of final notes, you can always spray a fungicide before the high risk season. That'll provide you with safe pasture for a period of time. It's not commonly done on lifestyle blocks just because of the practicalities of spraying the whole pasture, but it is an option. You put it on a couple of weeks again before the high risk period, leave it for seven days to kill those spores, and then you can graze the animals on it pretty safely for about five weeks. And then just a note on fecal spore counting, you can measure the spores coming out in an animal's faeces and drop in faecal samples to your vet clinic for them to measure. This is not preventative, it's more of a diagnostic tool to tell you how much they've eaten. But at that stage that it's coming out the back end, it means the damage is already going on on the inside. So I just thought I'd mention it so you knew what was out there. Okay guys, a lot of info for you there. I'll leave it for today. Please don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you for the next one. Bye bye.